Hey everyone, I'm Megyn Kelly. Welcome to The Megyn Kelly Show. The media's disgusting gaslighting of America. That is where we begin today before the EJs join us in one moment. We were gaslit on President Joe Biden's mental acuity for years. As recently as March, we had MSNBC telling us this was the best Joe Biden ever, most cognitively fit, better than ever, and then they were exposed at that debate, but the lie was never acknowledged. They just moved on. Same for Vice President Kamala Harris. She defended the president as totally fine, mentally robust even, for years. Never came clean, just quietly subbed in for him, and three weeks later hasn't said one word about any of it. The same media is now telling us Harris is suddenly a wordsmith, someone who speaks with merry conviction, has social warmth. And that was from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> uh, imagine what the left is saying about her. And is tougher, she's tougher than the guy who just got shot in the face and rose up with a fist pump. The same media is telling us that those two Olympic boxers who won gold medals this weekend did not test XY and are in fact female. But they did test XY and they are male. The International Boxing Association is on record through its doctor saying as much. And now we've had the former NBC and LA Times reporter, Alan Abramson, come forward and verify earlier reports that he personally saw the test results and they showed male. Similarly, Emane Khalif, the one boxer from Algeria, her trainer, his trainer, has revealed, reports Redux Mag, that a French hospital found a problem with Khalif's chromosomes and that Khalif was well aware he, quote, might not be a girl. This, as a commissioner of the Spanish Boxing League, comes forward to reveal that Khalif was considered too dangerous for women to fight in Spain, saying, quote, whoever we put Khalif with was injured, end quote, and that they had to pair Khalif with one of Spain's top male boxers before finding an even match for Khalif. Even the IOC, which had been maintaining that these two boxers were female based on their passport identifications as female, appeared to give up the game this weekend saying, quote, it is not as easy as some may now want to portray it, that the XX or the XY is the clear distinction between the men and the women. This is scientifically not true anymore. And therefore, these two are women. They're not. You got XY, you're male. And these two have XY, according to more sources now than I can count. And a woman is going to get killed if we keep allowing this. This same media is telling us that Governor Tim Walz did not quit the National Guard in order to avoid going to Iraq, that he filed his paperwork to quit the Guard before he got any notice that he was being deployed. That's not true either. We know for a fact that Mr. Walz was told he would be getting deployed in March of 2005. There was a notice saying it's coming. And his office publicly circulated that notice at the time. We've seen it. But a commander from his unit told CNN over the weekend that it actually was earlier than that, that Mr. Walz and the unit knew, the commanders, well before Walz filed any papers to run for Congress, that they were going out. They were about to get deployed and that that notice came as early as the fall of 2004. In any event, Walz did not quit the Guard until May 2005. That was three months after the written notice that he'd likely be going. And it's true that while the final official deployment notice didn't come until July, Walsh knew well before July that he was likely going to Iraq with his unit and there's no question that he quit anyway. Everything else is revisionist history, all right? He quit knowing they were about to be deployed. That is a fact. The same media telling us that he made a mistake when he exaggerated his rank in the National Guard repeatedly, something he continues to do, that he misspoke when he claimed he served in war, which he didn't, that he misspoke again when he said or allowed others to say that he served in Operation Enduring Freedom, meaning the war in Afghanistan, which he didn't. He misspeaks a lot and always in one direction. This same dishonest partisan hack media is telling us that Governor Walz did not make Minnesota a refuge for kids with gender confusion, that he did not sign a law allowing young children to come to Minnesota fleeing their parents 
who do not wish for them to cut off their healthy genitals, that he did not allow courts to take custody of these young, confused children and allow minors to sterilize and mutilate themselves away from their loving parents. But he did. He did exactly that. And finally, they're telling us that Tim Walz did not sign a law mandating tampons in all grades four through 12 bathrooms, including the boys' bathrooms. Except he did, and there's no doubt about it. A woman named Jill Burkham with the Minneapolis Star Tribune, a hack paper dedicated to helping Democrats, wrote a piece over the weekend trying to argue that because the law has not yet been followed in one large school district in Minnesota, instead they're putting tampons only in their gender neutral and their girls' rooms, that the law must not include the mandate it says it does. I have news for you, Jill. The fact that a district is ignoring the law does not invalidate the law itself. And if a trans student sued that school district tomorrow for noncompliance, they'd win. The law says tampons must be made available to menstruating students in all bathrooms used by kids in grades four through 12. Republicans tried to amend the bill to limit the language to only girls' bathrooms. That amendment was defeated. The sponsor of the law said, quote, trans boys, meaning girls pretending to be boys, need tampons too, and therefore sanitary products must be placed in the boys' rooms. So the products must be available to all menstruating students. I think there was some discussion earlier about um, boys' bathrooms. Would that allow a school district, at least in the especially in the elementary age, to not have to put men's, these products into the, the male, the men, boys' bathroom. Um, this bill requires that schools provide free period products in all student bathrooms grades 4 through 12. Trans boys menstruate, and they use boys' bathrooms and would need these products in order to ensure that all menstruating students have full access to period products, it is important that we include them in all bathrooms where trans students who menstruate may need to access them. Okay. That woman won the argument, and now the law is perfectly clear. The mandate is unambiguous. And while Jill points to a clause that says a plan must be developed by the school district for the implementation of the law, that does not allow the law to be ignored. Jill, let me give you a little legal lesson. That's not how laws work. You don't say, here's a mandate, but then you can totally ignore the mandate if you want to ignore the mandate. Implementation speaks to how the law will be complied with. For example, what amount of tampons to put in the boys' rooms versus the girls' rooms. This was specifically debated as the law was under consideration with an understanding that the boys' rooms could have fewer supplies. But whether to comply with the mandate is not up for debate. It's a law. Tampons to any menstruating student in all bathrooms 4 through 12. And Minnesota believes trans boys menstruate. That they use boys' bathrooms. And those bathrooms must stock up on Tampax. By the way, so offended was Star Tribune reporter Jill Burkham with my reporting that she encouraged yours truly to try doing some journalism. I guess to come up with a misleading, legally misguided report just like hers? Maybe I'll do that, Jill, and become a rep reporter just like you, who no one has ever heard of doing partisan hack journalism for a dishonest paper that has endorsed nothing but Democratic presidential candidates for the last 40 years. To be clear, you didn't, needn't even be a reporter to figure out how this law works. Being able to read and understand a statute is sufficient. Maybe Jill can't do that because she's not an attorney, but I can, and the law is clear. It's a mandate. As for Jill and her stellar journalism advice, I think I'm gonna pass. We decided to pull some of Jill's very journalism-y musings for the Star Tribune editorial board on which she sits. And I gotta say, I'm slightly doubtful about Jill's objectivity. Just a few examples. She and her board urged Trump to quit the, the, quit the presidential race back in 2016, lamented the overwhelmingly white jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, which involved a white man shooting other white men who attacked him, applauded the Trump farce fraud verdict handed down by Judge Engeron, suggesting the Trumps have no conscience 
and that voters in November should be guided by Judge Engerong's use of the term pathological when it comes to Trump. She and her pals called Trump a disgrace after the business records case conviction celebrated the label of convicted felon and chastised voters who still plan to vote for Trump. See, Jill knows better. In the COVID madness, Jill and her colleagues defended mask mandates, begged for booster shots, and as recently as 2022, Jill personally expressed a vague hope that maybe someday, this is 2022, someday, quote, with vigilance, COVID-19 will be more manageable. But for the time being, encouraged vaccinating, boosting, masking up again, switching over to remote work, putting other mitigation measures back in place. She and her paper backed DEI in Minnesota schools, naturally. Such an objective journalist doing so much journalisming. As soon as Waltz was picked by Harris, Jill and her board buds celebrated the choice, writing, Waltz makes the ticket. Good. Then Jill personally tweeted a link to the Harris campaign's lies about Trump supposedly blessing Tim Waltz's handling of the Minneapolis riots, commenting, well then, Jill, what happened to the journalism? That was a fake news report. Or were you too busy trying to find a school district blowing off the tampon mandate to do some real reporting on what happened in your own state? On August 6th, she tweeted this about Waltz's first campaign speech. Oh, Waltz went there with the couch reference. So fun and what a moment to celebrate and circulate, Jill. Tim Waltz, for whom it appears lying is a signature move, lies again, but it's so fun because it makes J.D. Vance look bad. Did you journalism there, Jill? Did you report that this was a disgusting smear? You know, like you did on all the Tim Waltz stuff that was actually true? Didn't see it. Maybe it's still coming. I'll wait. The point here is not to pick on some sad little lady whose Democrat dreams may be endangered by her hero, Tim Waltz's far left policies. The point is Jill and her paper and this disgusting, enabling, lying, partisan hack media are gaslighting us all on so many important issues. And there is no choice for those of us who can still report truthfully, who one, are able to do that, capable of doing that, and two, have the platforms to do so, that, that we must, that we must do so all the time no matter what. Joining me now, two people who know that very well. Emily Jashinsky is DC correspondent for Unheard and host of the new show, Undercurrents. And Eliana Johnson is editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon and co-host of the Ink Stained Wretches podcast. Together, they are the EJs and they join me now. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. If you're tired of the same old coffee from those mega corporations pushing their woke agendas, listen up. It's time to take a stand and support a brand that truly embodies American values, and that's Blackout Coffee. They stand with hardworking Americans who believe in family, faith, and freedom. They roast some of the most incredible coffee you will ever taste using only premium grade beans, roasted and shipped to you within 48 hours. And for the cold brew fans, Blackout Coffee is excited to announce the launch of their two new ready-to-drink cold brew coffee latte options. Don't settle for less. Make the switch to Blackout Coffee. Head on over to blackoutcoffee.com slash MK or just use the code MK when you're checking out to get 20% off your first order. That's blackoutcoffee.com slash MK. The code again is MK. Join the movement. Taste the difference. Remember, with every sip, you are supporting a brand that stands for America. Be awake, not woke. Ladies, great to see you. Um, you my head's going to explode with all the insan insanity and gaslighting that we are experiencing on those and many other fronts, which is what inspired me to just write down some thoughts on it. I'll start with you, Eliana, on your reaction. The media coverage of this campaign, I think, is the most... <laughs> overblown positive coverage for a Democrat that we've seen in quite a long time. What I'm most struck by is that um, Kamala Harris, and I, and I don't blame her 
has not sat for an interview, has not conducted a press conference, um, while at the same time throwing overboard her stated positions from the 2019-2020 campaign on fracking, on Medicare for all, on mandatory gun by guy uh mandatory gun buybacks, excuse me, um, on ICE, which she said, you know, we need to start from scratch in terms of how we handle illegal immigrants. And I think a press that was really interested in covering this would be demanding answers from her as to how and why did you come to the position that you no longer believe in those things? What happened here, as opposed to simply reporting that she's changed her position and allowing her to make statements through anonymous aides. And it really does matter um, because she is right now there's she has no policy platform on her website. She's campaigning on on vibes. So I think you've hit on something uh, on something really important. And I'll wait to uh, to circle back on walls and his military service and 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 so on, um, given that I really do think at the end of the day, this race is going to be um, fought between Trump and Harris. But as you mentioned, the Walls thing is simply indicative of the way that um, the media is covering this race right now. I mean, covering like, you know, like a <laughs> thinking of Thinking I mean, about Megan, somebody how many in the times? middle of Montana underneath their quilt who's got Raynaud's disease like I do, or your circulation doesn't work that well. That's how much they're covering. Go ahead, Eliana, what were you going to say? In the same, you know, we've seen the same story written in three different outlets, the AP, the Washington Post, and I forget the third one off the top of my head right now, that as Kamala Harris campaigns on joy and excitement, Trump <laughs> offers dark themes. I mean, uh, NBC News might be the third, but Quite literally, we're seeing the same headlines multiply across uh, the mainstream media while there is no um, examination of the number of serious issues on which the Democratic presidential nominee now has flip flopped and a demand for answers on about why. Yeah, it, it's so frustrating, Emily. I mean, we know that the press is dishonest, that they're in the tank for Democrats, but the, on their favorite issues, whether it's defending Kamala, defending Joe for a while, defending Tim Walz now, defending the fake, you know, sexual labels in terms of uh, sex identification, all of it, it, their lies must be protected. People who report what is real must be destroyed. And their little cabal I guess, just sits back and pats themselves on the back about how they get away with it. They change the national narrative and they are hoping people like us will just be screaming into the wilderness, but it's not working. That I, That's actually not working. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts, somebody like little Jill Burkham did not think that I would respond to her, but I will, Jill, because I'm not afraid of you. You don't control me. You don't control any entity for whom I work. I work for myself. And frankly, you can F off with all your journalistic pretenses, given your disgusting partisan hack record. Go ahead, Emily. Well, yeah, and those are the people that are asking for the public's trust. They're the ones that have demonstrable records of double standards, and they're the ones that are demanding that the public trust them. And the public has obviously stopped buying it. Now, that said, one of the things that struck me about your amazing opening there is that the these people, the gatekeepers, uh, elite gatekeepers, they've never been less powerful. They are still powerful. You know, there's a new survey out showing that words people are associating with J.D. Vance uh, are, are now extreme. The word extreme, the word weird. And what's so creepy about that is you could run a narrative on Tim Walz or Kamala Harris about their policies on children and LGBT issues, uh, the tampon policy. You could do that. The media could choose to focus on that just as much as they focused on an old J.D. Vance comment on the child as cat ladies. They could choose to do stuff like that about the very current policies of Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, and they could probably shift public opinion a little bit by doing it because there's something to work with there. But even when they don't really have something to work with, they're able to still They'll manipulate public opinion in a, to a certain extent. But what's freaking them out and what's freaking people like your friend Jill out, Megan, is that they're losing mm. that power. They're losing that power uh, because people like yourself are in these spaces and telling the truth. And that's really frightening for people in the elite media because they're not used to not being the gatekeepers. So it's amazing, astounding, the fact that they're giving, I think this is coverage like Obama got 
I think Kamala Harris, who is a much yeah. worse candidate than President Obama was in 2008, she's now getting the same level of coverage as, as he is. And everything else is just being totally tuned out. And their total ability to manipulate public opinion is it, they don't have it right now like they used to. And they're lashing out. It's very frustrating for them. They really are used to having a complete monopoly on the messaging, but for Fox, there'd be the annoying Fox News, but that was it. That's the only one they had to deal with. And now things have just completely changed. To your point, Eliana, Kamala Harris, she she spent 71 seconds speaking to the press on Friday because J.D. Vance has been everywhere saying, where is she? And this is supposed to suffice for an interview, I guess, or some sort of a press conference. And honestly, the the lapdog media says, OK, yeah, that did suffice. We got access to her. And what what tough exchanges do they have ready? And don't tell me that they weren't ready for her to just pop back into the plane and ask her a question. If you are covering campaign, you have your best questions in your back pocket, ready to go in case something like this happens. So she pops back here, back there. And what is she asked about this critical matter? Listen, there's been a lot of questions about when you're going to sit down for your first interview since being the nominee. I've, have I've talked that? to my team. I want us to get an interview scheduled before the end of the month. So the question is, when are we going to ask more questions? When can we ask more questions? And the answer is a noncommittal, like I hope to maybe schedule something before the end of the month. Maybe we'll Next schedule something. Isn't that from the head of the White House Correspondents Association as well? I believe that was Eugene Daniels, who's currently the head of the White House Correspondents Association. So somebody I who should know, really he, be at the top of the. Isn't he the political guy, Eugene Daniels? Yep. Yep. Yeah, he's the hack who was calling Brian Kilmeade a racist for saying yep. uh, college. And he said she said colored and he ran with it. Uh, I don't know if that's the one who asked that question, but that's what that Eugene guy from Politico did. And he ought to be ashamed of himself. Go ahead, Aliana, because that's not going to cut it. It shouldn't cut it. But the, the reason the press is not melting down saying this is effed up, you know, there was a day in which the White House press corps would start boycotting. They would throw an absolute fit if they had no access to a campaign like this. When we're, you know, m weeks away from voting starting, she's not given one interview, even on the switcheroo, her in for Biden. Never mind her policy. There's nothing on her website. Maybe this week, they said, we'll get some policies. This is madness. Yeah, and I don't want to underplay the significance of the coverage, even though the um, the grip of the mainstream media has been loosening since, you know, bloggers appeared on the scene in the early 2000s. Um, it really, really matters. And again, I don't blame Kamala Harris. I blame the press for continuing to write positive stories despite her refusal to uh, answer serious questions. But she's not even being put serious questions aren't even being put to her. Um, and it is significant. It is significant because um, part of the vibes that she's writing is, is the positive media coverage that we're seeing every day, which is she's, she's running a joyful campaign while Trump um, is, is, uh, you know, offering themes of darkness. And we, you know, we can talk about Trump later. I, don't think things are going so great there. Um, however, um, in the real world, um, in the real fact-based world, media coverage would be about her tightly controlled campaign and the reasons for it, um, including that every time she spoke extemporaneously in 2019, things went quite poorly. Um, it was in a CNN town hall, unscripted, not on a teleprompter, when she said she was all in favor of banning fracking in 2019. And it was off the cuff when she said she wanted to abolish Medicare for all. All of these statements that she has been forced to repudiate this time around in 2024 were things she said in off the she cuff. She wants to abolish moment. private health insurance. Yeah, abolish private health insurance. Um, and that is why. She's not out on the trail, but we really have not seen a piece of hard hitting news coverage explaining to people why she is not sitting for interviews. She's mm -hmm. not very and good yet, at that. And yet there's J.D. Vance everywhere. You know, I mean, you're not seeing Walsh either. Where's his big sit down? Where's his big come to Jesus so we can ask him these questions? Why did you think it was fine to take custody away from loving parents and give it to the state so that they could have genitals chopped off? Why was that a good idea? 
Why did you make your state a sanctuary for those people? Why why did you say repeatedly you were part of Operation Enduring, Enduring Freedom when you weren't, you went to Italy, you never picked up a gun in war as you claimed? Why'd you do that? Why'd you blow off those vets who came to your office to say, please stop doing this? It's stolen valor. You just fucking blew them off like they were nothing. Why did you, all these guys from your unit, come out and say they felt abandoned? Are they asshole liars making up lies about you? Or do you think you might have handled this very poorly and made a decision that left them feeling abandoned? No, he's not going to sit with me. But somebody with some balls needs to ask him some questions, too. Instead, what we're getting, Emily, is they're underground. Sure, they're joyful because they're coasting (laughs) through an election without a single hard hitting question coming their way. Or a primary campaign. Yeah, they have nothing to be upset about. They should be floating on air right now. Absolutely. And uh, to the point about Waltz, the first question I would actually ask Kamala Harris, if I were, I was thinking this when that interview happened, the first thing I would have asked her about was because that Waltz LGBT kids policy was so extreme. Honestly, as a reporter, that is the first thing I would have been curious to ask Kamala Harris about. Do you stand by this? Do you support this? She, I doubt she will get a question on that unless, you know, someone shouts it at her from independent media or from Fox. I doubt she will get a question on that for weeks, 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 if not ever. I don't know if anyone serious is ever going to actually ask her that question unless she's in a debate with Trump and he asks her that. I mean, that policy is so extreme. She picked him anyway. And normally reporters would be furious about getting no access to a campaign like like this. One thing that I've heard is she's giving them off the record access on planes. And so they sort of feel like that's sated, like they have some access to her, even though it's not access for their readers and their listeners and their viewers. It's just access for them, which is such a, such a perfect statement on the press, right? The, to the extent they want access, it's for their own personal knowledge, as opposed to yes. the people that they're supposed to be serving as journalists. So their lack of fury over getting uh, so few interviews with Kamala Harris is so telling in and of itself. There's so many questions to ask her. And if your first one is just what that one that you just played was, Megan, I mean, what a pathetic, pathetic scene. But we all know where they stand on Harris versus Trump. It's just going to solidify it in so many people's minds for the next couple of months. It's going to be an incredible split screen and they're going to lose more power because of it. They're like, what a fun field trip through the swing states we're getting this summer. I'm really enjoying learning about Pennsylvania. That's not what you're there for. That you're, By the way, PolitiFact contacted us, reaching out, trying to fact check me on my assertions about that Minnesota refuge law, all of which are 100% true. Let me just give you a little pro tip, media fact checkers. Stop trying to fucking fact check me because I read the law and you don't. They fail every time. Guess what? They didn't do it because I was right. But their knee jerk is let's get her. Let's get her because I'm a truth teller. I'm not controlled and I'm not saying the things that they want, which makes me very dangerous. Fine. I'm I'm good with that. But the real media needs to be confronting controversy when it's staring them in the face. Blair, they don't care that it's children. They don't care in the Olympics that it's women. How about the history in Spain with Spain saying we can't put a woman against this boxer? They, they are. She's too strong. He's too strong. And they are getting hurt. Nope, they're not reporting it. That's that's Redux is a great follow on X. And this woman has been doing great reporting, but so few others do. So on and on it goes like the cover up of their favorite issues and then the media totally compliant. And I'll say this on the on the field trip, Eliana. Did you see that thing in the Olympics where, you know, they made breaking now an Olympic sport, break, break dancing. And there's some <laughs> woman who's like a professor in break dancing. Ray Gunn. Who, Rachel who Gunn. Went, is it, okay, so I'll keep, I'll keep it with you, Emily, because this is so funny. So she went Thank and you. she performed. Thank you, you saved me. <laughs> and she went, she performed, and basically she did what you and I could do. <laughs> Gosh, I, <laughs> I danced like Elaine from Seinfeld, and I could have done what that lady did. <laughs> way better, and, that would be way better. The, the memes were like, I can't get over this woman who got a free field trip to France <laughs> by claiming she was a break dancer and wound up in an Olympic contestant. That's what the media are. They're that breaker. They're getting their free field trip, but knowing nothing about the craft that they're actually there for. And here's what's funny is that she theoretically knows everything about the craft that she's there for, because again, she is my new obsession, Ray Gunn, Rachel Gunn, B-girl Ray Gunn. She has a PhD 
in quote cultural movement something like that she literally has a <laughs> phd in it and you can see her basically like struggling to do the game plan like you can draw it up but if you don't have the athleticism and the rhythm <laughs> there's no thinking in the world that could make you like an olympic breaker but because of the way the olympics outsourced the breaking competition like the uh, basically the qualifications here you have rachel gunn in the olympics just making a fool of herself and sadly enough, her country. It was incredible. The memes have been amazing. I went down a dark rabbit hole yesterday on this. That's that's the media on the Kamala Harris plane. Yes. That I couldn't they think all of have a masters from in. Columbia and Northwestern. Yeah, they all have master's degree in journalism from Columbia right? and Northwestern. And that's how they do it. Yep. And then they're asked to do the journalism. And instead of doing like the amazing moves that we see actual breakers in New York City do all the time, we see somebody try to do a cartwheel and call yes. it a Olympic sport. The kangaroo hop that she did. Yeah. I'm, but, I'm into her. I have to say, tip of the hat to you, madam, on getting your field trip to Paris because <laughs> it's wonderful to be in Paris in, 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 in the summer, I guess. Um, we've got to spend a minute. There's so much to go over, but J.D. Vance is everywhere. He's everywhere. Trump held this long presser on Friday. They're putting themselves out there. No one from the Democratic ticket is. And here's J.D. Vance doing a pretty masterful job of trying to spin Dana Bash's attempt to club him. I mean, how many weeks have we been on the cat story now? Trying to club him like a harp seal, and he flips it back on her watch. What do you say to key voters like that, Republicans, swing voters, sure. who are put off by your views? If you look at what I said in context, the Harris campaign has frankly lied about what I actually said. Kamala Harris has two stepchildren. Pete Buttigieg and his husband have adopted twins. Do you recognize them as parents and more broadly as being part of families? Well, of course I do. Dana I think she's has made some bizarre statements. She has said things like it's reasonable not to have children over climate change. And you've now asked me three questions about comments that I made three years ago. Uh -huh. I wonder what Kamala Harris thinks about the fact that she supported policies that opened the American southern border. I wonder what Kamala Harris thinks about the fact that she lied to the American I'm interviewing people you, not about Kamala Harris. Joe Biden's mental middle facility for the office. You are interviewing me, Dana, because I respect the American people enough to sit down for an interview. I appreciate that. Kamala Harris has been the nominee for three weeks. She hasn't sat down for a real Believe interview. Believe me, we are asking. Okay, you're asking, but then they're still going along with it. They still, all of them cover her rallies, ride in her plane, write about her nonstop with the joy and the all, you go girl with their Madam President t-shirts on. But the, truly, Eliana, the, the answer by these sycophant media members needs to be F off. We will not cover you until you sit for an interview. We are, we are not there to do PR. That's what's happening here. Well, the reason that Trump and Vance are out there so much doing interviews is that the media has made it impossible for them to dominate a national news cycle until um, since Harris uh, was elevated to the top of the uh, Democratic ticket three weeks ago. And the same thing should be happening for Harris until she sits for interviews. Um, it should be very, very difficult for her to dominate the news cycle um, simply with rallies and speeches. Um, but it, but uh, again, I don't blame her. It is the, it is the fault of the press that's allowing her to lead the headlines um, and lead the front pages of newspapers with positive press every single day uh, without sitting for interviews or taking critical questions. Um, but that is precisely the reason that you see Trump and Vance out there. And Vance, I think, actually, Megan, did a better job in that CNN interview than he did on your show responding to uh, questions about that. I think he, after you know a rough week rollout, has has um, found a more solid footing as Trump's vice presidential nominee. Um, I thought he did a nice job in that interview. So what we're seeing now, though, instead of the media demanding access and even in the absence of access, just doing in-depth reporting on these insane policy positions that they have said that they hold and that in Tim Walz's case that he has enacted as governor of Minnesota, they're doing stories on Trump allegedly calling Kamala Harris a bitch behind closed doors. Okay, his team denies it. I couldn't care less. Who, ca who <laughs> gives a flying fig with, I'm sure he probably did call her a bitch. Who cares? This is what she says about him, listen. 
I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women. Fraudsters who ripped off consumers. Cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. I know Donald Trump's type. Why am I supposed to care, Emily, if he, in response to being called a sexual predator, fraudster, criminal by her openly, behind closed doors may have said, she's a bitch. I don't know if you saw Mike Allen of Axios tweet out the story, but he put three siren emojis on top of Kamala Harris reportedly being called a bitch by Trump. Like this is some major piece of news. And again, it just shows how little they understand about their own audiences. Uh, the, The news consumer, the American public, who for so many of them, you can tell them that Donald Trump has been calling Kamala Harris a bitch. You could call they could hear that he called the Statue of Liberty a bitch and they would still vote for him <laughs> because they think Kamala Harris's policies are terrible. And they're sta- they're scared of uh, the extreme policies of the left. And the media doesn't. Another th- reason they don't ask Kamala Harris's questions like the one about Waltz's extreme LGBT children policy is because they don't understand that that does also matter to voters. They have no understanding of their audience. So they get tired tied up in these ridiculous stories about Donald Trump allegedly calling Kamala Harris a bitch that does not matter to anyone, let alone anyone. does it matter to the degree. No. And you know what? With the way they manipulate the narratives, they could easily be doing s- stories right now on how J.D. Vance, to the point Eliana just made, found his footing, how he has been media forward. While Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz hide from the press, J.D. Vance is going out there. We know if he were a Democrat, that is the story that they would be doing on J.D. Vance, mm-hmm. that he is crushing it in interviews, that even though he's getting bad press, he's going and talking to journalists. He's talking to them on the plane. He's talking to them in sit downs. He was all over the Sunday shows this week. But no, none of that. We're still talking about the cats. Well, speaking of uh, calling Statue of Liberty a bitch, when Bo Deedle, colorful <laughs> character at Fox News, who's often on Hannity, ran for mayor, uh, he, there was some quote in his campaign where he was like, I'm going to keep this city safe, you know, all the way from, up from uh, from the Bronx down to that slut in New York Harbor. <laughs> That's so Bo Deedle. That's perfect. So Bo Deedle. The other thing we've gotten today is J.D. Vance pictured in a female Halloween costume. Like he was, they're saying, he likes drag. Because like, I mean, like many people, one year on Halloween in 2012, he dressed up, I don't know what it was, but he was wearing a blonde wig and was in women's clothing. It was a Halloween costume. And now he's supposed to be a hypocrite, a hypocrite, you see, because- The Republicans don't like drag in front of young children. They did this same thing to Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake spoke out about drag being forced on little kids in public spaces in schools. Then they were like, she had a drag queen come and perform at her birthday party. It's not the same thing. And any rational person knows that. But I guess we're just going to go with he's like a drag queen now. It was also so insulting to actual drag, like actual drag <laughs> artists. Like J.D. Vance just they would do a better than that. wig on. He looks like a <laughs> women's study professor. Like that's my guess as to what this costume was. <laughs> and by the way, Eliana, didn't you go to Yale? Yeah. Are, are your friends as mean as J.D. Vance's friend? Friends, because <laughs> every day another one releases some private correspondence with the guy, private pictures of him at a party. They seem like terrible people. By the way, uh, well, he went to the law school, which is like the most radical school within Yale, um, well known for that. But the correspondence is quite interesting. The correspondence that's gotten um, a lot of attention is his correspondence with a friend of his who is trans. And at no point in the correspondence that this person has released, is he disrespectful in any way? Um, I actually thought it reflected quite well on him. Um And I wasn't quite sure what the upshot of that story was, other than he was that he was totally respectful um, to a friend with whom he had developed personal disagreements. He was loving, kind and supportive of this trans person. The person broke up their friendship because he came up publicly and said he doesn't want these treatments for children. And that was enough for this person to completely turn on him, try to publicly humiliate him, go to The New York Times, go to CNN elsewhere to try to embarrass him publicly. This person's a bad person. This person's an ass, all right? That's it, that's all there is to it. A bad friend, as is whoever tried to embarrass J.D. Vance with a stupid Halloween costume. I mean, 
it's just so absurd to try to make that a comparison. I, I the gyrating leather strap bondage bond, uh, drag performances that we're seeing in like the bluest of blue states in front of the young ones, trying to make them look at some guy's naked ass with nothing but a leather strap through his crack. That is not yeah. the same as a law student male going as some sort of a female character on Halloween. I hate to break it to you, but that's another thing normal people understand. Uh, it's just, well, oh, it's, it's infuriating. Go ahead, Eliana. The New York Times quoted another friend of uh, Vance's from law school who cited as the reason for friction in their relationship that Vance's uh, barbs about the elites at Yale became too pointed. And the Times actually quotes this as some kind of shot at, at Vance, uh, as if any normal person would take umbrage at the fact that J.D. Vance, uh, you know, arrived at Yale and found the place snobby and out of touch or that he has criticized, you know, Ivy League elite since then. Um, it's th that genre of journalism of what your former classmate said about you is uh, is n not a strong one. I, I oh, don't I think. Got talk about empty calories. Um, all right. So now and particularly, by the way, at a school like Yale, full of strivers who one can presume are incredibly envious of where he's ended up in life compared to yeah. them. Yeah, I know. Well, the same thing. And I've got Tim Walsh every day criticizing him for graduating from Yale Law School and going on to work for Peter Thiel as a Silicon Valley billionaire. He's like, oh, sure. He's working class. Sure. He went to Yale Law School. Hello, that's the American dream, Emily, right? To like get yourself Min up, improve your circumstances. I was gonna say Minnesota's own Eliana Johnson went to Yale. No, now she's a partisan hack elite. You're not allowed to do that because that's then right. you're not, you're, you've lost all touch with I your wish, roots. I wish I could say measure. it was a working class success story, you guys, but- S Sorry, uh, Eliana, not, not you, really. you are not from Minnesota anymore. <laughs> not really. You, you have See? zero, it's an zero- elite Twin Cities kid. That is all Tim Walls had to do when they misstated his military uh, credentials many, many times. Just be honest, like Eliana just did. Just a gentle, good-humored correction of the record. We're going to do his military thing in the next segment, so I'll just table it for now. But I do want to get to back to Kamala. So we don't hear from her at all. No media interviews, her stupid tarmac interview with a couple of reporters, which was 71 seconds long. And so we glean little bits and pieces here and there in her stupid speeches, which are completely curated. And she dropped this doozy on, was it Saturday? Where she stole Trump's proposal on tips for oh. service workers. Um, it was Saturday in Vegas. All right, so first, I'm just gonna give you, I'm gonna give you what she said on Saturday in Vegas, where she slipped in a new proposal, allegedly of hers, when I am president, we will continue our fight for working families of America. Including to raise the minimum wage and eliminate taxes on tips for service and hospitality workers. Oh. Oh, you don't say. So she stole that from Trump which he tweeted out and he was 100% right. It was his proposal and he made it months ago and he explained how he came up with the idea when he spoke at the Republican National Convention. Listen. Uh, we're having dinner at a beautiful restaurant in the Trump building on the Strip and it's a great building and the waitress comes over. How's everything going? A really nice person. How's everything? Oh, sir, it's so tough. The government's after me all the time on tips, tips, tips. I said, well, they give you cash. Would they be able to find him? She said, actually, and I didn't know this. She said, very little cash is given. It's all put right on the check. And they come in and they take so much of our money. It's just ridiculous. And, but I said to her, let me just ask you a question. Would you be happy if you had no tax on tips? She said, what a great idea. I got my information from a very smart waitress. That's better than spending millions of dollars. And everybody, everybody loves it. Waitresses and caddies and drivers. Now, this reminds me of the second working girl reference in a week on this show. Working <laughs> girl. When 
Melanie Griffith's character, who was a secretary working for Sigourney Weaver, who then goes on some fancy vacation, breaks her leg and gets laid up. And Melanie tries to pose as her boss. She came up with an idea while posing as the boss for this merger between Trask Industries and this other industry. And the guy loved it. And she was putting together this big deal. But then Sigourney Weaver, the boss, comes back from the broken leg. And she steps in and tries to claim this deal as her own. And Mr. Trask figures out that this was not Sigourney's idea. This was the idea of the lowly secretary. And he goes to each of them and asks in his investigation to figure out who, get, who deserves credit. How did you come up with this idea? And we've cut a clip. This is Forbes. It, it's just your basic article about how you were looking to expand into broadcasting, right? Okay, now, the same day, I'll never forget this. I'm reading page six of The Post, and there's this item on Bobby Stein, the radio talk show guy who does all those gross jokes about Ethiopia and the Betty Ford Center. Well, anyway, he's hosting this charity auction that night, real blue bloods, and won't that be funny? Now I turn the page to Susie, who does the society stuff, and there's this picture of your daughter. See, nice picture. And she's helping to organize the charity ball. So I started to think, Trask, radio. Trask, radio. And then I hooked up with Jack, and he came on board with Metro, and and so now here we are. Well, Miss Parker, let me ask you a question. How did you come up with the idea for Trask to buy up Metro? How did I, uh... Well, let's see. Well, you know, I would have to check my files. I can't recall exactly. Miss Parker is Kamala Harris. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but I nailed it. That's the perfect analogy for what we just saw. It's ridiculous, Emily. Also, that was encyclopedia level knowledge of the working girl plot. <laughs> I love that movie. Everything the detail. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's this is another great example of media coverage. Uh, they would be going crazy if this had happened in the other direction. And by the way, Trump's story about how he came up with that proposal, it sounds plausible. It sounds believable to me. I don't know that it's true. Just because Donald Trump says it doesn't mean that it's true. It sounds plausible. Either way, if he were a Democrat, one big storyline of this election would have been how he came up with that idea because mm -hmm. it's really brilliant and it's a very powerful political narrative uh, and that's ob obviously why Kamala Harris is cribbing it I mean in Nevada this goes a very very long way uh, towards you know appealing to working class voters who are hugely supportive of Donald Trump more than they have been for other Republican candidates so it's really really smart and the media at the time some outlets legitimately tried to undercut it and say, ah, this is just nonsense. It doesn't mean that much to workers. It won't make that big of a difference. And now Kamala Harris does it. And people are like, wow, this is so smart. Where did it come from? Uh, so it's just like a, another perfect case study in what we've been talking about. And the media is just total double standards. It's so pathetic. Trump tweeted out uh, or posted on Truth Social, uh, Kamala Harris, whose honeymoon period is ending and is starting to get hammered in the polls just copied my no taxes on tips policy. The difference is she won't do it. She just wants it for political purposes. This is a Trump idea. She has no ideas. She can only steal from me. And Eliana, what we saw over the weekend on X was hysterical posts. Like um, there was this one, was it Curtis Hook? Oh no, he did not this one. Here's for the listening <laughs> audience. There's one guy taking a test on the left and writing Trump no tax on tips. And one guy copying off of that guy and labeled Kamala Harris like in a testing situation. And then look at this one. They're saying this is Kamala Harris at her next rally. It's her wearing a Trump wig. <laughs> I love this so much. She, you know, I guess if you can't beat him, join him. But there'll be no acknowledgement, Eliana, that she completely copied Trump's homework. Well, it's quite interesting um, it, to take a serious look at this, that this is the one specific policy proposal she's put out to date, and it is one of Trump's policy proposals. Not only that, but this is a proposal, as Emily mentioned, that's aimed at the working class. And these are the voters that the Democratic Party over the past eight years has uh, been bleeding to the GOP. So um, if you want to Think about what Kamala Harris may try to do, and we're supposed to see more economic policies from her this week. Um, I think that's the way to look at this. Yeah, 
just look at, let's go start pouring through Trump's proposals because that apparently is where she's gonna, she loves all of his proposals. She apparently doesn't like Joe Biden's, but she's joyful. You see, she's joyful and ignore all those reports about what a nightmare she is to her staff, all of whom have quit because she's joyful and definitely not the B word. Um, there's so much more to get to. We're gonna take a quick break, more with the EJs right after this. Are you ready to transform your nights and elevate your days? Discover the unparalleled comfort and luxury of Cozy Earth. I love Cozy Earth, like their bamboo sheet set. It's made with premium viscose from bamboo, and these sheets are incredibly soft. They get softer with every wash, and their breathability is unmatched. They keep you cool all night, every night. But that's not all. Cozy Earth's bath collection is a game changer, especially the Lux bath sheets. These towels crafted with a unique blend of cotton and bamboo viscose using innovative technology are impossibly soft and plush. I ignore all the rest of my towels in favor of my Cozy Earth towels. Quality and durability are at the heart of Cozy Earth. With a 10-year guarantee, Cozy Earth products are built to last. Upgrade your nights, transform your days with Cozy Earth. Just go to CozyEarth.com slash Megan and use the code Megan for up to 40% off your order. CozyEarth.com slash Megan for up to 40% off. And mention you heard about the Cozy Earth products from my show, and they will send you free socks. How do you like them apples? Minnesota governor and Democratic vice presidential pick Tim Wall skipping the Sunday show circuit this weekend. I mean, he could have easily responded to all of the allegations that he abandoned his fellow soldiers ahead of their deployment to Iraq. You have to wonder, why didn't he? Why, why wouldn't he? Such serious allegations in any network would have given him ample time to fire back. At the same time, though, we're getting new examples of the governor misleading Americans about his military record. First, Politico noticed on Thursday that the Harris-Walls campaign quietly changed Governor Walls's bio on its campaign website. People, he is still doing this. As of last week, he was calling himself a higher rank than he actually earned. The governor's bio was referring to him as a retired command sergeant major. But as our audience knows, and the Minnesota National Guard has confirmed, Governor Walsh did not complete the necessary training to retire as a command sergeant major. It would have required an additional two years of service and training, which he did not complete. He retired at a lower rank, that of master sergeant. Some veterans say this is an example of stolen valor. He is claiming he achieved a rank that he didn't earn. Others did. Their sacrifice gets diminished by him trying to claim he did it too. And the Harris campaign, of course, trying to sweep the change under the rug, not owning up to their silent switcheroo. Meantime, the Washington Free Beacon, Eliana's outlet, unearthed a video from 2007. In this video, you are going to hear Nancy Pelosi thank Tim Walz, again, this is 2007, right after he became a member of Congress, for his service on the battlefield, and the then congressman fails to correct her. He will speak for himself, but I want him to know how much we all appreciate his service to our country, whether it's in the classroom or on the battlefield. Like, well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you to the leadership here. Why didn't he correct her the way Eliana just did when Emily said she was working class from Minneapolis? It's so easy. And honestly, having been at Fox News for so many years, you see veterans do this all the time. If you misstate or especially inflate their rank, the level of service and anything having to do with their combat experience, they will correct you. Out of deference and respect for the people who actually held those titles and did that kind of work. Not Tim Walsh, and she even said he can speak for himself. But when he did, he didn't correct it. C-SPAN, the network that aired that press conference, also labeled Mr. Waltz as an Afghanistan war veteran on its Chiron, or lower third. To be clear, Mr. Waltz never served in combat in Afghanistan or in Afghanistan at all. He served in Italy in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, which was the fighting in Afghanistan. He never served in Operation Enduring Freedom. There is a difference. Now, maybe Mr. Waltz didn't hear Ms. Pelosi's remark. It's likely he never saw that Chiron but it's part of a pattern with this guy. And here we have yet another example where Mr. Walls clearly heard his service being misrepresented and did nothing in real time to correct the record. The clip we're about to play is from 2016. It's an interview with C-SPAN 
The host says Mr. Walls retired as a command sergeant major. No, he didn't. Then the host goes on to say that he served with his battalion in Afghanistan. First, Mr. Walls just nods his head in agreement. Watch. Congressman Tim Waltz, also a member of the Armed Services Committee and Veterans Affairs, Democrat of Minnesota, highest ranking enlisted soldier ever to serve in Congress, enlisted in the Army National Guard at 17 and retired 24 years later as Command Sergeant Major and served with his battalion at Operating Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. And I read that. In Afghanistan, he shakes his head yes. That was the time to do it, sir. We on this show actually do care about completeness and fairness. So we went back to make sure Mr. Walls did not correct the record after that particular clip ends. He did nothing about the misstating of his higher rank. We looked at the full interview. Seven minutes into the discussion, Mr. Walls slides in the truth about Afghanistan, but does not say to the host, I want to correct the record and make it perfectly clear. He just offers up this. Uh, my guard unit backfilled uh, to Europe to provide the security mission as the 173rd moved to Afghanistan. They rotated back. Our guard unit moves home. Many of those same soldiers deployed for 22 months right after that. He does this all the time. It, it feels like a verbal sleight of hand where it, he, he wants, it's very clear, the listener to believe that he was in Afghanistan, that he was there, that he was part of Enduring Freedom, and he wasn't. Uh, and by the way, what's so wrong with saying, just to correct the record, I actually didn't serve in Afghanistan. Just do, why, why wouldn't you do that out of respect for those who did? Because you want people to believe it's true. On Thursday, Vice President Harris was asked to respond to this controversy over her running mate. Did she take it head on? Answer directly to the cameras that Mr. Walsh's fellow soldiers are wrong about him? <laughs> yeah, no. She gave the most non-answer one can give, just praising anyone who has ever served anywhere. Some of the criticism has been about your vice presidential pick and his leaving the National Guard at 24 years. Vance said that he deserted his own troops or his own colleagues. What's your take on that? Listen, I praise anyone who has presented themselves to serve our country. First of all, that question was so bad. Why are these people so bad at it? You ask a pointed question. You know, after 24 years, he left the National Guard. What? That's not the question. The question is, your vice presidential running mate is being accused by his fellow unit members of abandoning them because the unit was told they were deploying to Iraq, and instead of going, he quit. He was the one who trained them, and they felt he cut and ran. What's your response to those men? Okay, there. I wrote it for you. Good luck, press corps, on the next 71-second interview time with her. Back with me now, the EJs. God, it's so frustrating to watch them attempt the journalism and fail at the journalism. But Eliana, um, there's going to be more clips. He, this is a pattern with this guy. And every day now since he got named, we have found several. He, as I said in the intro, always makes this, the mistake in the same direction to make himself sound more glorified than he really was. Man, Megan, I got to say that was a real flashback hearing you formulate a question to our debate prep where you'd be <laughs> like, no, no. Not sharp enough, flabby. Uh, but <laughs> look, with the walls, with the walls thing, um, you're absolutely right. And there are several issues. I think it can be confusing because there's so many different um, smaller issues within the bucket of the way he's talked about his service. So there are four issues here. One is the matter of his title, where it's clear that he attained the title but um, didn't take it didn't stay in long enough to keep it. And the campaign was a had provisional. to provisional. He, he had the provisional exactly. use it of the title. Contingent, contingent yeah. upon his staying in the service, taking the required courses. So the campaign had to do cleanup duty on its website for the bio it had for him. The second is to his reference um, of the arms he had used in war, um, though he never saw combat. And the campaign, again, said over the weekend, um, it, NBC News wrote an article about this, that he had spoken in error. So on two things, they've done cleanup duty. The other two things are um, 
did he serve in Operation Enduring Freedom or did he serve in support of Operation Enduring Freedom? He's obviously let folks say that he served in Afghanistan when he served in a support role in Italy. That seems to me less significant of an issue, though um, these matters have been controversies and issues throughout every campaign he's run for office since 2006. And the fourth, which I think is the most significant of these, Megan, has to deal with the timing of his retirement from the National Guard um, in 2006, where he filed to run for Congress in February. His unit got a warning that they were likely to be called up in March. He said at the time that if called up to serve in Iraq, he had a duty to do so. He retired in May and his unit was called up in July. Um, so he is on the record um, after his unit was notified that it was likely to be called up, saying that if called, he had a duty to serve. And he went on to retire and run for Congress. Um, and I think thinking about these things sort of in those four categories makes them a bit more easy to understand. But this is not a new controversy for Tim Walls. He's clearly played fast and loose with his title and the matter of his record, allowed people to wish cast onto him what they want to be true and what probably he wants to be true, um, and has taken no pains at any point to collect uh, to correct the record. And look, national politics is different from state politics. Um, he's getting more scrutiny this time around. And mm -hmm. already twice the campaign has had to go out and do cleanup on this despite not having sat for a real interview or taking hard questions on this. Mm -hmm. Those facts that you just stated are indisputable by both sides. In a, in a motion for summary judgment in a court of law, you could put those down as undisputed facts. That, that, that timeline you just laid out. He filed an intention to run for Congress in February. In March, a preliminary notice of deployment went out. Uh, thereafter, he said, if my unit is deployed, I, I have a responsibility to go. And then... He quit, and then they got the official deployment notice. That happened. However, there's a soldier who served in the role he claimed he had overseeing a different unit, but in Minnesota, same thing, like they were all together, who says, we were told we were going to Iraq before he even filed the notice to run for Congress in February. We knew in the fall of 2004 we were going to get sent. It doesn't happen that it's just suddenly like, hey, you're going, and then you go. <laughs> there's a long lead up time for these soldiers. And this guy, um, a former Minnesota National Guard Command Sergeant Major, Doug Juline, went on CNN and said, we were told in the fall of 2004, listen. People don't really understand the concept or the, uh, the chronological events as they occurred. And, and I'm gonna kind of start back in the fall of uh, 2004 is what we received, my, cam my commander and myself, of the 1st Brigade, 34th uh, Infantry, Infantry Division Brigade Combat Team, what's called a notification of sourcing, which is a NOS. We were informed that we would be uh, alerted to go to Iraq uh, within the next upcoming year or time period out there. Start preparing your team. Getting, from that going forward, uh, we met with the one of the 125 field artillery, uh, introduced ourselves, talked to them, and give them a heads up, this is what's happening. Uh, we don't know a full particulars, but we will get to it. The 125 is Wallace's unit, Emily. That's on the record testimony from this fellow command sergeant major saying we were told, we were told before he filed that notice to run to Congress, we were getting sent to Iraq. That just puts the lie directly to everything Tim Wallace has told us. And that's a, a way to further sharpen your question even more. Whoever gets first access to Tim Walsh, I guarantee you they won't use that or do that. Yeah, at best, at very best, he's clearly complicit in over-representing his military service. That's at very best, let alone was actively involved in the over-representation, which I think is increasingly clear that that was probably the case. And what's frustrating is that, I mean, God bless Tim Walsh for serving his country. I didn't do it. I don't like criticizing people who did it uh, over, you know, the the nitpicking, but this is more than nitpicking. This is really serious. And uh, to the point that uh, you made, Megan, a lot of vets are extremely sensitive about this issue and for good reason. And they're so sensitive that they will immediately, immediately 
correct people who overrepresent the extent of their service. And I think that also partially explains why we are seeing people come out now to correct the record about Tim Walsh, to offer the facts that the media has been, uh, again, at best, slow to provide about the reality of Tim Walsh's service, because people really are sensitive. A lot of people died in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it does make a very big difference in this case. And he's just not going to get away from these questions. One thing that also is, to Eliana's point, I think, surprising and doesn't speak very well of the Harris campaign or that entire operation is that this has been bouncing around Minnesota for a while. I mean, Eliana may be a kid from the Twin Cities, but if you follow, I I imagine, Eliana, you were already aware of this because people have known this about Tim Walls in Minnesota for years. This has been something that's been out there. And the Harris campaign doesn't appear to have been prepared to respond to it because they're even taking things off of their own website like did they vet this guy or did they just go off the vibes that Kamala Harris had with him at that Sunday meeting at the Naval Observatory because this is going to be a huge problem when you have veterans criticizing your vice presidential campaign from now to November I mean that's that's really really tough stuff to work around what about Eliana because one of the things um gosh uh it was Alpha News which has been doing such a good job covering Tim Walz and Minnesota issues in general they've been on the show uh Liz is it Liz Cole? Colis? I Colin. Forget. Colin. Forgive, forgive me, Colin. She's amazing, and I love her. And she did that great documentary on the Derek Chauvin case and verdict that we featured on the show. Well worth everybody's time. But um, she was one of the ones, she tweeted out that this was the headline that the Star Tribune um, ran with when this first broke in Minnesota about Tim Walz, or at least when it broke in 2022, it was resumed. The headline they went with was GOP opponent who never served criticizes Governor Tim Walz's exit from National Guard. Zero interest from all the journalism journalists in looking into whether it was true. And these guys had a legitimate right to object to what he did. Yeah, well, I think anybody who's familiar with the Star Tribune and with the tenor of its coverage of Democrats in Minnesota has been, would not be surprised um, to hear that there, Minnesota is no stranger to, it's it's basically a one party state, no stranger to controversial Democrats, including Ilhan Omar, and has not covered itself in glory, holding the powerful to account um, uh, in its state. You know what? It's amazing, because as I said, I was looking into this hack paper, And as I point out, for 40 (laughs) years, they've done nothing but endorse Democrats. 40 years. Now, I have been alive for all of those 40 years. I haven't actually been able to vote in all of them. But I've said before, in my like election past and voting for presidents, I voted for Democrats and Republicans. And I actually went back and looked at it. Do you know that in my, I guess it's eight presidential elections, I have voted for four Democrats and four Republicans. So you can suck it, Star Tribune, because I'm a lot more independent and down the middle than you hacks are. I actually am not a partisan. I'm not an ideologue. I can see truth, even if it undermines a narrative I previously believed, which allows me to be more right tomorrow than I was yesterday. This is one of the key tenets of being a good journalist. If you've you've endorsed only Democrats for 40 years, there's something wrong with you. There was never a Republican in all that time with ideas good enough to endorse him. I mean, it's just, it gets to the problem that we are dealing with in this cycle, in this nation, in this show, which is these partisan guys who drive the narratives, whether it's Tim Waltz and this, you know, it's really his dirty ass opponent who's the problem in pointing out that he's lied, right? And, and totally disrespectful to the actual actual serviceman, Emily, who had the balls to come forward and say, I object to this, like com- completely dismissive of those guys. But that's fine because those guys are trying to hurt a Democrat. Well, and as some good reporters uh, at the Free Beacon and other places have been trying to debunk uh, the media narrative about Tim Walz, one of the things that struck me is that there was a Facebook post from some uh, vets 
that served, I think they served with Tim Walls. It was from like 2019. It was posted in like 2019. And this was, again, indication. I mean, that's five years ago. This stuff has been going around. It's It's been known about. These comments have been made in public. It's not crazy. And another dose of cold water. I mean, one of the few things that I have seen out of uh, legacy media in the last few days is the segment that Steve Kornacki did showing uh, Tim Walls' margins among actual rural, uh, blue collar voters in parts of Minnesota, frankly, where, yeah. where Donald Trump is actually fairly popular. And Kornacki does this segment and looks and says, Tim Walz is governor because of the t- the Twin Cities area, which is more urban, which is more affluent in the suburbs of Minneapolis, actually very affluent in the suburbs of Minneapolis. And that's the reason that he is governor. And when you look at the media narrative about him, how many stories, on, bullshit stories, by the way, on his fashion choices have there been? Politico Mag ran that like fashion oh guy, God. I don't even know his name, saying like, oh, Tim Walz is in his L.L. Bean barn jacket. He's so authentic. Nobody in the Midwest wears $200 L.L. Bean barn jackets unless maybe they live in the suburbs of the Twin Cities and are trying to like cosplay as a real working class person. And so the coverage of him just like start to finish is just nonsense. And it's from people who have no idea what they're talking about and don't want to look at the actual numbers is this guy can he really talk to rural working class voters or does he just maybe look like someone who can does his military service has it been misrepresented uh no because only republicans are saying it so we don't want to spread disinformation that's how they make decisions about what's important and what's not we we have to get to in our next block what trump is doing to bring these messages out right because there are a a bunch of pieces out right now on how his campaign has been flailing and poll numbers which are not good. The New York Times Siena poll just moved three critical states away from Trump. They were lean Republican and now they're back to toss up, um, including it's uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin. Right. Were those the three or was Drew, I'm trying to remember? I have it written down. Yeah. Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin. Pennsylvania must stay in Trump's category. I mean, Pennsylvania is going to decide the election. He can't lose it. He went down to Georgia and said a bunch of things about Brian Kemp. No one gives a shit that he doesn't like Brian Kemp and Kemp doesn't like him. He needs to stop attacking the very popular governor of Georgia. I get that it's a long feud. I get he doesn't like the wife. Just stop. Just stop. You owe it to your supporters to stop doing anything to undermine your chances in Georgia, which is another must win. But let's just table the Trump problems for a minute because I want to want to stay finish up with Walls and then talk about Kamala for a second. Brianna Keelar, who is terrible. She's at CNN. She's another partisan hack who should have been eliminated during the Brian Stelter, Don Lemon cleanup that they did. But she managed to hold on. And uh, she decides the real story here is J.D. Vance's military service. Listen. I also think that J.D. Vance, as a messenger on this, may be an imperfect messenger. Because we have, as you introduced him, as a combat correspondent, which was what his title was. But when you dig a little deeper into that, he was a public affairs specialist, someone who did not see combat, which certainly the title, combat correspondent, kind of gives you a different impression. So he may be the imperfect messenger on that. Okay. She admits in, this, in the clip, that's, that was his title. That's why he was introduced that way, because that was his actual title. Uh, But she doesn't like his responsibilities over there. So she would like to compare him unfavorably, Emily, to Tim Walz, who refused to go to Iraq. J.D. Vance fired back at Brianna Kilar saying, come on, when asked to go to Iraq, I went and he served his country honorably. No, he wasn't in service for 24 years like Tim Waltz, but he also was in service as a Marine for four full-time years, for four years full-time as a Marine, and served overseas in Iraq during a dangerous time. The nerve of this woman to try to diminish him because she doesn't like the actual responsibilities he had while there. And I think it's something you only do if you're trying to rationalize your own partisan uh, favor for the other person, uh, because you just, you can't handle that there may be an imbalance on this particular issue, that maybe J.D. Vance has more credibility on this issue. So in order to to rationalize you feeling wrong about that, right? Like it can't be right that J.D. Vance has more credibility on this. Let's not give him anything. We don't wanna give him any credit. Uh, so you know what? Yeah, it's his title, but it's over. It's like it's his freaking title. This is the, it's the actual t- 
title. Meanwhile, Tim Waltz is using the wrong title and doing the overrepresentation, which again, at best, the best spin you can put on it is that he's complicit. He's allowing other people to say it. He's allowing his campaign to write it. So again, it's at best he's complicit, but at worst, he's actually actively participating in it. And we know for a fact the title is attributed incorrectly. So that's actually J.D. Vance's title. I mean, give me a break. You're going to split hairs when it comes to J.D. Vance, but you're not even going to split those hairs when it comes to Tim Walls, or you're going to choose to split the J.D. Vance hairs in this case instead of focusing immensely or more on the Tim Walls ones at all. I mean, that's a great representation of where their mindset is, actually. Not to mention, as a member of the press, you think she'd have some respect for the dangers that even embedded reporters sent to Iraq faced in trying to bring the story back to Americans, um, never mind somebody who's actually a Marine. So F you, Brianna Keelar. Uh, you're not a supporter well, actually, of the troops. She's she's always trying to claim like she's married to a, a military guy. And like she when she actually starts talking about them, it's always like this. Go ahead, Eliana. I think it's worse than what both of you are saying. I think um, her remark was an intentional obfuscation of the issue here in that Nobody has accused J.D. Vance of misrepresenting what his position was or what his duties were when he went abroad. He writes about them in his book uh, that he was a press correspondent and he helped uh, the Marines field media inquiries uh, in Iraq. Um, she says he may not be the best messenger, um, apparently because he didn't see combat. That's the implication. Um, but the accusation against Tim Walls isn't that he didn't see combat. It's that he misrepresented his responsibilities and his duties. Nobody's trying to diminish his record of service to this country. Um, there, The criticisms are that he has not been honest about it. That's and didn't go to combat and didn't go to combat when he knew it was coming his way. I mean, we had on Tom Behrens, the guy who uh, went mm -hmm. and fulfilled this role instead as command sergeant major. He was on the day after this story broke last week. And he was saying he left his guys in the lurch. He was like, you have to understand in the military, this kind of thing is unthinkable. Like he helped train them. He was the highest non-commissioned officer. He trained these guys, they're getting ready for war. And then when war came, when it was time to actually go do the thing that they'd been training for, he cut and ran. That's why he saw it as such a betrayal of the guys. You, you know, it's, it is about more than just the whatever, stolen valor, if you want to call it that, but the, the using a rank that doesn't belong to you. He knew they were going and he chose not to. He let them go with someone else and men in his unit died, men that he was responsible for. So I really don't want to hear it because you're right. J.D. Vance has never misstated what he actually did. She may not like his title. That's the title. Too bad if you don't like it. It's just they're so gross. Here's one other guy, by the way. This is John Kolb. Lieutenant Colonel, he's the man actually who would take over Waltz's unit. Um, I don't know how his responsibilities dovetailed with Barron's because I know he also took over some of them. But he had a post that's been making the rounds on um, Facebook and it reads in part as follows. I do not regret that Tim Walls retired early from the Minnesota Army National Guard, did not complete the Sergeant's Major Academy, broke his enlistment contract, or did not successfully complete any assignment as a Sergeant Major. Unwittingly, he got out of the way for better leadership. Tom Behrens was the right leader at the right time. He sacrificed to answer the call, leaving his family, business, and farming partner, brother, to train, lead, and care for the soldiers. Like a great leader, he ran toward and not away from the guns. By all accounts, he was a competent, uh, this is back to Walls, he was a competent chief of firing battery gunnery sergeant and first sergeant. I cannot say the same of his service sitting frocked in the command sergeant major chair. He did not earn the rank or successfully complete any assignment as an E-9. It is an affront to the non-commissioned officer corps that he continues to glom onto the title. I can sit in the cockpit of an airplane, doesn't make me a pilot. Similarly, when the demands of service and leadership at the highest level got real, he chose another path. I'll tell you guys, I don't know where this lands ultimately, but at a minimum, it has completely neutered the Harris Waltz campaign's ability to tout this guy's military service completely because what people will be thinking is it's marred. He did something. Didn't he not serve? He didn't go to Iraq. Didn't he say he did more than he did? He said he used a gun in combat. 
Haven't they had to walk all this stuff back? I mean, that's how it works in people's minds, Emily, even with a sycophant press corps. Yeah, it does. And one of the Trump campaign's narratives against Harrison Walls is basically that they're frauds. Uh, and, you know, they've had varying successes in leveling those arguments against Harrison Walls. I mean, it's still they're still testing it out. Their entire campaign was against Joe Biden and they've had to totally, uh, you know, rethink that strategy when Kamala Harris stepped in late in the game. Um, and so I, I think actually that's where this gets even more damaging is that's a pretty critical uh, part of the broader narrative that the Trump campaign is trying to make stick against these two is that they're frauds, that Kamala Harris is a chameleon, uh, that they'll just sort of blow wherever the winds go. Another reason her copying Trump's uh, taxes on tip proposal is, is probably uh, that it has serious potential to backfire on her and her She's campaign. Weaver. So I, yeah, she's a Courtney Weaver. Um, and so that is, I, I mean, I think that is actually really a serious problem for them with Tim Walz. It's just, you know, the whole thing, I get the Trump, you know, Vietnam narrative. I understand that. But Donald Trump isn't running on his character. I mean, he he never has. It's never been a part of why voters are like, yes, this man. Uh, but with Tim <laughs> Walz, they're trying to make it a huge part of him. Right. Donald Trump himself has says, has said, you know, I'm part of the system and that's how I know I can fix it. All of those things. Tim Walz, they rolled him out as this guy of sterling uh, heartland character. He is just the guy next door that you would trust. You're going to go get your cup of sugar from Tim Walls. And so that's where this is different than the Trump side by side, because they've made character really central to his narrative. And this absolutely calls it into question. I'm really not. And I'm certainly not bringing any children who may be suffering depression or an instinct to, God forbid, engage in cutting or anorexia, who might get poor autism, who might get pulled into the trans confusion, given the messaging from society to Minnesota. Certainly not. Keep your kids the hell away from Minnesota if they're in any way suffering, because that's the stuff that gets confused for gender confusion. And before you know it, they're missing a body part and are sterile for life. I'm not exaggerating. This is actually happening in modern day America. Eliana, Emily's point about the fraud allegations, you know, these are fraudsters. They're not who they say they are, is a good one. And we've seen Trump team, you know, trying to perfect that message more and more. She helps daily in her weird accents that she's trying to do, depending on which group she's, there was another one. I mean, I just, I can't get enough of these, but here's yet another one that she busted out um, on, it was when she was speaking to the UAW, UAW, UAW chapter in Detroit. Here it is at five. You know, the one thing about all of us is we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work is good work. Oh God. Thank you to the sisters and brothers of UAW for all you are and all we will do over these next 89 days. God bless you. God bless you. Okay. So she's in Detroit. Emily's got her hand up to her forehead. <laughs> so it hurts. It's, it makes me cringe. It's Clinton-esque, actually. She's, I mean, she's black, just in case you didn't know. That's what she's trying to say. I'm black and I understand people who live in Detroit because I talk like this. That's what she's doing. And here was another such moment that's recirculating now, given that she keeps doing this in front of largely black audiences. And it is when she went on um, and spoke about Tupac being her favorite alive rapper. All right, this is a few years ago. It's 2020. Watch this. Best rapper alive, Tupac. He's not alive. You say he lives on. But not you a lot. I know. I keep just. <laughs> you said. Listen, West Coast girls think Tupac lives on. I'm with you. I'm with you. So Tupac, keep going. Keep, keep doing that. <laughs> um, who would I say? I mean, there's so many. I mean, you know, it. <laughs> I. There are some that I I I would not mention right now because they should stay in their lane, but um, others I. <laughs> Oh, what that going. means. I want to know who one of those are. Keep moving. Okay, all Keep right. moving, Angela. All right. I didn't. That was not supposed to be a stumper either. What about? Uh -huh. um... Oh my god, I'm I'm cringing. She clearly, she didn't know. She had no idea. Tupac died in 1996. It wasn't that she, we West Coast girls, want to say he's alive. That's not what was happening. She didn't know. It was the only name. What she does knew. she know? I know. Does she know it's something about Tupac's whereabouts? Is he alive? <laughs> and does she know? Can she tell us? No. 
<laughs> she knows nothing. <laughs> it's part of this. She's a fraud. Why can't she say she should said just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm not I'm into rap interviewer. I, was say, I don't like was, rap. I like, like pop. That was like if you asked me who my favorite rapper is and I was trying to fake it, what my response would have been in an interview. <laughs> but also, that is why she's not doing interviews. Case in point. You have it. You know right what there. it reminded me of? You know what it reminded me of, Eliana? Reminded me of um Katie Couric and Sarah Palin. So what's your favorite? you know, Supreme Court decision. Not right. Or like what newspapers do you read? Oh, all of them. All of them. All of them. Yeah. All of them. All right. Could you like name one? And she doesn't. It was the same thing. She doesn't know. She didn't. She, it's like she is a fraudster. She's trying to pretend she's something other than she is. And the worst part of it is so is the media. Okay. That leaves me, leads me to this. And then after this, we got to touch on Trump. Time Magazine. Hold on, Time Magazine. August 12th, 2024, the reintroduction of Kamala Harris. The soundtrack suggested a Beyonce concert. The light up bracelets evoked the Eras tour and the exuberant crowd, more than 14,000 strong, lining up in the rain resembled the early days of Barack Obama. Inside a Philadelphia arena on August 6th, Vice President Kamala Harris was greeted with the kind of reception a Democratic presidential candidate hasn't gotten in years. Fans packed into the overflow spaces, waving homemade signs made of glitter and glue as drum lines roared. When Harris introduced her new running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, the cheering lasted more than a minute. If you'd predicted this scene a month ago to anyone following the race, they would have never believed you. But Harris has pulled off the swiftest vibe shift in modern political History, a contest that revolved around the cognitive decline of a geriatric president has been transformed. Joe Biden is out, Harris is in, and a second Donald Trump presidency no longer seems inevitable. Democrats resigned to a grim death march toward certain defeat, as one national organizer put it, felt their gloom replaced with a jolt of hope. Harris smashed fundraising records, raking in 310 million in July. She packed stadiums and dominated TikTok offering a fresh message focused on the future over the past. Volunteers signed up in droves. Trump's widening leads across the battleground states evaporated over the span of a few weeks. In late July and early August, Harris became a political phenomenon. Our campaign is not just a fight against Donald Trump, she told the cheering crowd in Philadelphia. Our campaign is a fight for the future. Where has this Kamala Harris been all along. And the piece goes on to posit her own party underestimated her. Maybe the crowded 2020 primary just wasn't the right race for Harris to showcase her talents. Maybe the vice presidency wasn't the right role. And then it goes on. <laughs> Eliana, if they, somebody wrote that copy for you at the Washington Free Beacon, I feel like they would no longer be working at the Beacon for more than two minutes. It's uh, it's a little effulgent, I think is the word. A little Fulgent. purple. <laughs> purple. Prose is, uh, I mean. Gay? Look, is that what that means? What does that mean? What is, what's no, purple? <laughs> it's not over the top. <laughs> okay. Over the top. Um, Just reminding us of your Yale degree. Uh, I know, she's so fancy. <laughs> I don't even know if I used that word right. Somebody can, I'm sure someone will correct me in, in my Twitter mentions. But One of your classmates you know, would be like, Eliana never knew the words at Yale. She, she never knew them. She a replaced picture of her using a, dumb words. Yeah. <laughs> she replaced a dead guy on the ticket. Obviously, there was a vibe shift. Um, <laughs> she didn't have to go through a primary where they were all where Democrats were criticizing each other and putting out policy proposals and having it out. I mean, it is obvious that the party would be thrilled that Nancy Pelosi managed to shove aside somebody who was uh, looking like a sure loser and that she was coronated and put atop the ticket. Um, so it's 
somewhat amusing to me that none of that is mentioned. If there's anything that would be calculated to produce uh, good feelings and vibe shifts, it would be precisely what Democrats had managed to engineer, which was leaving Biden on the ticket when there could have been a when there was a primary. Um, and then shoving him aside when he uh, when it looked like he was going to lose. And that's when the critical media coverage of him began to come, when the media, too, realized that he was going to lose. And then putting her atop of the ticket without um, any primary campaign. Any vetting. Um, or- Remember those two minutes when the press was exactly. like, honest and they were covering Joe Biden? Those were That was a fun two minutes. All right, quick break. When we come back, Trump. You know how much we love our dogs. Yes, even our Strudwick, we love him. He causes me terrible headaches but we love him. Wait until you see what he did this week. Anyway, uh, I can't imagine life without them. (laughs) They've got a great life, thank God, but some dogs are not so lucky. That's why I want to tell you about Delta Rescue. This is the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They have rescued thousands of dogs, plus cats and horses too. They provide all the animals with shelter and safety and most of all, love. And they've been doing it now for more than 45 years. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to stay open, and giving can bring tax benefits too. Speak with your estate planner about how you can grow your estate while helping animals in need. And check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more. We love Thunder and Strudwick, but we would love dogs who do not have anybody loving them right now to be well taken care of and looked after. Delta Rescue helps the pups who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. That's deltarescue.org. Some Americans enjoy using their credit cards because it can be a hassle-free and secure way to pay. But our sponsor, the American Payments Coalition, says that some D.C. politicians want to change that with the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. They say the bill lets corporate megastores pick how your credit card is processed, allowing them to use untested payment networks that jeopardize your data security and rewards. They say corporate megastores will make more money and you will wind up paying the price. Find out more info at guardyourcard.com and consider telling Congress to guard your card while you're there, too. I said at the top of the hour, three states had been moved closer to Kamala Harris, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin in considered a gold standard poll. New York Times, Siena. Um, It is now Harris 50, Trump 46 in all three of those states polling likely voters, which is what we care about. Um, That's not good for Donald Trump at all. And they're reporting that it's due to stronger position than Joe Biden had with most demographic groups, including white voters without a college degree. So she is doing better with a working class, whatever part I think of the democratic coalition that is, than Biden was. On top of that, the Cook political report on Thursday moved from lean Republican to toss up Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada. So that's bad news for Trump in both the Sun Belt and the Rust Belt. And what exactly is Team Trump doing about it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Emily. Trump, to his credit, came out and did, you know, an hour plus presser on Friday, answered a bunch of questions. All the media does is like take the latest controversy. He told some story allegedly involving Willie Brown and Trump on a helicopter that Willie Brown's denying and Trump says it's true. And then they said there's another black Democrat in California who he might have confused Willie Brown for. I haven't heard Trump's answer to that. That's what the media went with. He's doing a spaces with Elon tonight at at eight. But the point is his messaging is getting snuffed out. It's it. He's not getting a ton of earned media coverage the way he did in 16. And I just don't know what team Trump's plan is to write this ship. Some of it is is absolutely his fault. Um, some of it is I don't know how any Republican could be even polling close to where he's polling in those swing states and in the national polls with this level of media hype for Kamala Harris, with this level of media dishonesty for Kamala Harris, with this level of propaganda for Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. I mean, it's been absolutely insane. And sometimes I think even myself, I forget and take for granted how crazy it is that any Republican runs as close as they do with Democrats in this country, given 
the treatment that Democrats have been getting over the last several weeks. I mean, the copy that you just read from in Time magazine, uh, if someone sent that to me as an editor, if I sent someone to a rally and they brought that back to me, I would say Kamala Harris had a very splashy launch when she was running for president back in 2019 and it fizzled. So maybe that's the story. Maybe when the, the story, maybe the story is that when Kamala Harris's honeymoon ends, when people like Donald Trump, Republicans start running in Pennsylvania ads about her energy policies, ads about her relationship with the Green New Deal, ads about uh, her relationship with Tim Walz and his policy towards LGBT students. When those ads start running and she has to start doing interviews to the extent she has to and to the extent they'll ask her good questions, what happens then? Everyone can put on a good show when it's stage managed and the media loves you. Uh, what happens afterwards? And so I think some of this is a, it is a little bit of a honeymoon. On the other hand, on my show last week on Undercurrents, I did a whole segment about where I think the Trump campaign is going wrong. They're not talking as much as they used to about powerful corporations that have allied with each other, with you know, big tech companies, with people on Wall Street to censor speech to uh, go after the American worker. He's just, he can talk about immigration. He does talk about immigration, but he's not framing it in the way that he did back in 2016, which is, you know, looking out for the little guy. Uh, he does some of it, but I think he does need to do a lot more of it to overcome the, uh, the obstacle that is extremely uh, hostile media coverage to him and extremely friendly media coverage to his opponent, especially in those swing states. The New York Times reporting, Eliana, that this is the worst three weeks of the Trump campaign and saying that at a fundraising event recently, Trump said, I'm not I'm those reports that I was nicer after getting shot were false. I'm not nicer. And then he was asked by some of the donors about getting back on message on some of the policy disagreements between the two of them and maybe steering off of the personal. And Trump's response was, I am who I am. So I don't know. I'm not saying he shouldn't attack her personally ever. I feel like if I were Trump, I'd want to do that, too, given all that she said about him. But somehow they need a different message to get out there or they need their message to be more ubiquitous. And it just doesn't seem like his punches are landing or I don't really even see a bunch of haymakers being thrown by him with the potential to land the way we're more used to with him. He doesn't have a disciplined, consistent message that he's getting out. His, um, you know, his big tweet over the weekend was about the size of her crowds, which he also went on about um, at that press conference where and uh, in that tweet or on Truth Social, he said her crowds are AI generated and this is a big fraud. Um, that's something he really doesn't need to be talking about. It's not going to move voters in this election. Um, look, of course, these are the three worst weeks of his campaign. He had a candidate who he was beating handily replaced by a candidate with a pulse. Um, so so that goes without saying that these were going to be hard weeks. The more concerning thing is that he is not driving home a consistent and disciplined message. Trump retains an issue advantage on the economy and on immigration, which are con which consistently voters say are the most important issues to them. So anytime he spends in press conferences or out on the campaign trail talking about anything besides that and pointing out that um, her record, uh, that we don't know where she stands on these issues are, uh, uh, and we don't know what her policies are, is wasted, lost time. Um, if he doesn't change this and find a message that he's going to drive home consistently, he's going to lose. All we heard from him in 15 and 16 was, China, build the wall, mm -hmm. make America great again. It was so simple. You could s recite it in your sleep. Can you do that this time around, Emily? It's like, nothing's coming to mind. No. Um, and, and Matthew Stoller, actually, who's on the left, he did a comparison because he supports some of Trump's populist economic policies, which, again, if your coalition, if you have to win Pennsylvania and you have to win Wisconsin and you have to win Michigan, if that's your electoral map to victory, those messages, however much Republicans may disagree with them, some Republicans may have ideological disagreements with them. Politically, those are the arguments that helped Trump win over those Obama voters who then went for him in 2016. And so he needs to be really vocal 
vocal about those messages over and over again. And I, I mean, I think there's this double edged sword to Donald Trump that the bad, you know, tweeting about Mika Brzezinski's facelift at six in the morning is also necessarily attached to the good, which is going way harder on the left than a lot of other Republicans have been willing to over the years. And that's another thing that helps him win. So I don't necessarily know that some of that stuff, I, I think so many Trump voters are just the kind of people who are like, I'm putting up with Donald Trump. It's not that I love Donald Trump. It's just I put up with him because I don't care how much he swears or tweets. I care about these horrible gender surgeries for minors. I care about the left selling my jobs out to China. I care about a wide open border that you are lying about or openly defending. And so I think that's you know still on Trump's side in those states. But to do that, he just has to be hammering. Like you said, Megan, it has to be the central part of his message. He has to be making it obvious and blatant over and over again, day in and day out. That is not happening right now. He can do it. You know, perfect phone call, perfect phone call. <laughs> like, he can do it. He just needs to do it. You know, we, we haven't seen that much of Trump lately, more than we've seen of her, obviously. But um, I, I'm sure there's some security concerns now in the wake of the attempted assassination that he's got to deal with in terms of he can't be too ubiquitous and too quickly. But um, he's losing in the messaging game. Her ads are everywhere. She seems everywhere. The media is in love with her and he's got to change the narrative and get his messaging back out there, not about Brian Kemp, but about how he's gonna change people's lives for the better. And he's got very able uh, campaign staff around him. I think they'll get there. I think they too are a bit, you know, reeling from what's just happened here. You ladies are the best. I love when you're on. Thanks so much for being here, gals. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Megan. All right, back tomorrow with a first time guest, Nate Silver. Looking forward to that. See you then. <laughs> 